the Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here, I, here am I dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we do praise you and thank you for calling us to this celebration this morning, a celebration of the resurrection. And we pray that by your grace, we might be filled with hope and faith as we experience once again your extravagant love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Parents, I have a question for you. Do you know what the three B's are as to how to embarrass your teenage child? 
three B's. B in public. B with your child. B yourself. <laughs> the three B's. I remember so well one particular situation where this was absolutely true of my father. We were at a, uh, we were having a family reunion at uh, a restaurant in Minneapolis. There were a bunch of uh, cousins there, my cousins, my folks' cousins, my parents. Maybe 20 of us all sitting around some big tables, I think like at an Olive Garden or something like that, public restaurant. And uh, my dad just loved these family get-togethers. And uh, of course, I knew that before we began eating, he would announce that we were going to pray. He always did that because whenever we went to a public restaurant, he always had to pray. What I didn't know at this particular dinner was he was going to say to us, let's all sing the table prayer. <laughs> And so we did. And I swear that everyone in the restaurant stopped sort of mid-bite and stared as we sang. I was just aghast. I thought, Dad, here, now, did you have to really, really? Oh, he thought it was grand. He thought it was grand. The three B's, how to embarrass your children, be with them, be in public, be yourself. My dad had that in spades. Well, the parable, which you just heard read, it was the gospel reading for the day, is a parable about such embarrassing parent-child situations on a number of levels. First of all, it is a parable of joy in the season of Lent, which I remind you is the season of repentance. So we might say, a parable of joy in this season, now, here? Isn't that a little inappropriate? Of course, we can easily see why this parable found its way into the readings for this season, because it seems at first blush, perhaps, a parable about repentance. Indeed, all of the parables in Luke 15 suggest this. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And they're all found. But if we look at all these parables at all, we soon see that repentance is not the common theme. It is joy. When the sheep wanders off, the sheep doesn't wander back. The shepherd goes to get the sheep and rejoices when he finds her. And when the coin is lost, well, naturally, the coin doesn't search back, but the woman searches for the coin, and when she finds the coin, she rejoices. And even in today's lesson, when the son who is lost, comes to himself and goes back home. His confession is cut off by his father before he can even get it started because his father is so full of joy. So this parable is also not about repentance. It is about joy. And so, even though today, in Lent, it may seem inappropriate to speak of joy, that is exactly what we will speak of. Now, of course, the story itself is where joy seems particularly scandalous. This younger son, you remember, has just squandered his entire inheritance a formidable sum, we assume. And there is not so much a mention of this waste by the father. Did you catch that? Not a reprimand, not a reminder of any of it. Indeed, 
while he is still far off, we are told the father runs out to him, embraces him, kisses him, and before he can get his confession out, calls the servants to get the party started. Extravagant joy. Of course, the elder brother sees this, sees the inappropriateness of this, and he points it out to his father. He says, Father, all these years, all these years, I've slaved away, and you've never even given me a goat to have a party with my friends. But when this son of yours comes home who has wasted all your money, you kill the fatted calf. He's really ticked off. He's really angry. But the father will have none of it. He says, son, son, you are always with me. All I have is yours. Don't you realize we had to celebrate? Because this one who was dead is alive. This one who was lost is found. There was no other option. We had to celebrate. Scandalous joy. That's what we have. Profound, exuberant, scandalous joy. And oh, how much there is for us to learn in this parable of joy. How much indeed. Because the fact is, no matter which son we are in this story, the father's joy is scandalous. It is so extravagant that we cannot imagine that our God could be like this. So let's consider now how this story speaks to our lives. Let's take the situation of the younger son. He goes to the far country. Luke says he wastes his entire sum of money on dissolute living. That's a... Uh, which we say, a modest way of saying he spends it on parties and prostitutes. Well, parties and prostitutes may not be our particular cup of tea, but I dare say there is no one amongst us who has not been to the far country. For the far country, you see, is the place where we go when we do those things that no one can see, but we'd be embarrassed if they could. That's the far country. So maybe, for example, we have an appetite for pornography. Well, that's the far country. Or maybe trashy novels and bonbons are our addiction. Or maybe we like to gamble with money that's really not ours to spend. Or we have an addiction to some substance, alcohol, that no one suspects. It doesn't really matter what it is. All of these things take us to the far country. They take us to the place where we can do the things that no one can see. But that we'd be embarrassed if they could. And when we go to such places, we do indeed squander our inheritance as the children of God. And of course, the result of this is always the same. Guilt and shame. It's always the same. So when we come to ourselves, when we suddenly wake up one day and we go, what am I doing here? This is not the way I was raised. This is not the way the children of God live. When we come to ourselves, we compose a prayer of confession to our Heavenly Father. And we fully expect 
than when we turn and head home. But God may have good reason not to take us in, may not take us back as one of his own. And if God does, we think, well, God will say something like, well, 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 look who's back. But instead, what does God do? When we come back from the far country, God rejoices with incredible joy. Yes. God throws a party. God goes completely out of control with joy over our return. Indeed, it seems that there is more joy over one sinner's repentance, ours, than there is over 99 others who have no need of any repentance. And indeed, that is so. For God's joy over one sinner who repents is beyond anything we can imagine. But in God's merciful economy, it is all exactly right. For we who have been lost are found. We who were dead have been made alive. And so God rejoices. But what if we are the elder son? What if we are the one who rarely goes to the far country or at least doesn't stay there too long? What then? Well, for us, the father's joy is even more scandalous. Because we are apt to point out to our heavenly father the inappropriateness, the injustice, the downright scandal of celebrating with people who don't have their act together. Indeed, we might insist that no one should be celebrating until everyone has their act together. Do we know such a posture? I dare say we do. Maybe you are like me. You were born in the church. You were raised in the church on tuna fish casserole and orange jello with carrots in it. <laughs> you know about the church. You know who works at the church and who pays for the church. You know the whole deal. And one day some new preacher shows up and says that we ought to be inviting people to church who just got out of jail. And you say, hmm. Don't invite me to that party. I'm not coming. Or maybe you, like me, have been in the service. You've worn the, the, the uniform for Uncle Sam. You buried the dead at Fort Snelling. And when the colors pass, you stand at attention and salute. And one day somebody says, you know, we should invite folks to church who don't have the same regard for America that you do. And you think, hmm, I might not show up for that party. Or maybe you, like me, went to a caucus the other night. And maybe you, like me, are very disturbed about the political climate in this country. The hate, the fear-mongering, the xenophobia, every other phobia, all on display. But then one day we hear that God says that even the people that we can hardly stand being in the room with are invited to God's party. And again we say, really? them? You see, we believe that God's grace and mercy are fine and dandy. But let's not get carried away, God. After all, what would happen if we were to get out that anyone is welcome 
and God's celebration. What then? Scandalous. Scandalous. You see, it turns out that if on one hand we are the ones that just came in from the far country, God's joy seems inappropriate because we don't think we deserve it. And so even if we come to the party, we just sort of stand in the corner with a little punch glass and make sure nobody enjoy, uh, notices us. And if we are the ones who worked like a slave for all the good causes of the world, and we are the ones who have paid our taxes and mowed our lawns and kept our walks shoveled, well, we too are scandalized by God's joy because it doesn't seem fair that everyone gets invited to the party. But the fact is, my dear sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the God we have. This is the Heavenly Father we have. This is the one who will not be denied his great joy. And so every Sunday we have a party. And every Sunday you are invited, no matter your sins or your virtues. You're invited to come and sing, and dance, and hear the stories, and drink the wine, and eat the bread, and embrace your other sisters and brothers in Christ. You are invited to the celebration, and God longs for you to come. This is God's scandalous joy. So, come to the banquet, for all is now ready, and all are welcome here. Amen.